Somewhere in Switzerland, in Neuchâtel, preparations are being made for a journey. John Howe, one of the principal illustrators of novelist Tolkien's writings, is getting ready to leave for the other end of the earth. John Howe is also one of the creators of the visual universe of Peter Jackson's films, adapted from Tolkien's works. His drawings have caught the imaginations of millions of readers and viewers all over the world. But John has not finished with Tolkien yet. Down in New Zealand, a mammoth task needs accomplishing. A fantastical journey still remains to be undertaken. After a lengthy journey, John Howe arrives in New Zealand, in the village of the Hobbits, the small creatures created by Tolkien in his famous novels, The Hobbit and The Lord of the Rings. Hobbiton is a cinema set that was built in the north of the country. It is partly a product of John's imagination, as nearly 15 years ago, director Peter Jackson invited him to work on his films adapted from Tolkien's books. His brief was to use his drawings and ideas to breathe life into Tolkien's wondrous universe. Despite having produced thousands of drawings for the films, John knows that he has not yet fully explored all the worlds Tolkien created. Many questions remain unanswered regarding the imaginary creatures, starting with those miniature inhabitants of Hobbiton, the mysterious hobbits. I'm not really sure what brought me to illustrate Tolkien or to be associated with the images created for Middle Earth, but uh, I found there's a density and an interest behind Tolkien, which is terribly fascinating and terribly deep. It's a sort of never-ending story because there's always a story behind the story you're working on. The road goes ever on and on. And uh, I don't think it's possible to actually become weary of that road because there's so much to discover. I had absolutely no idea who Peter Jackson was. I had never seen his films. I didn't even exactly know where New Zealand was 15 years ago. And we received this phone call at about two o'clock in the morning and Peter was on the line and uh, asked if I'd be interested in participating as conceptual designer for The Lord of the Rings. And I had not a clue what kind of an adventure we'd be embarking on and where it would lead. When we first started working on Peter Jackson's films, it involved transitioning from rather imaginary worlds in pencil and in 2D to a world that was entirely recreated in 3D. You end up walking through a little garden, looking at the furniture, the plants, and seeing highly evocative small details. And you spend your time wondering what's real and what's credible. All it takes to suggest the plans is a quick sketch, but then comes the mammoth task of the decorators, carpenters and everybody else to create the illusion it really could have existed. This comes from a small drawing, a small drawing that took just a few hours, and then in the end, here it is. It's like walking around a drawing. 
like walking around inside your head. I'm not sure it's a privilege given to many, but it really is quite extraordinary. The fantastical drawings are a sort of alchemy, a blend of two things. The form, of course, must be imaginative and mythical, but the substances, textures and colors must also be real. So you have to really look, look closer and then look again. Peter Jackson's films were shot among the wild landscapes of New Zealand. In many respects, these landscapes resemble Middle Earth, the imaginary continent where Tolkien's adventures take place. For John Howe, looking, looking closer, then looking again, involved roaming these landscapes in search of images and sensations that his drawing work is steeped in. When fantasy takes inspiration from reality, the result is most fascinating. Tolkien's words and John Howe's drawings fuse together and collude. I don't systematically spend time drawing in nature. The weather has to be nice. You have to immerse yourself in it and take it all in with your pencil. And you have to realize that the drawing you'll bring back can't possibly contain everything you've seen, but it might contain something a little more important, the feeling emanating from a landscape and the ideas it encapsulates. You head home a little cold and a little damp, but armed with the knowledge of what you've seen. I think that the only link I could reasonably be said to have to Tolkien's work is that of nature. I think his stories, his entire oeuvre, are a sort of ode to nature. I'd like to be able to capture some of that feeling. So, as I'm no great writer, I tell my stories with a pencil. Having spent a few years here now, I tell myself it's been a blessing to have been able to come here, because man is largely absent from this landscape. So we're not constantly confronted with the traces of other humans, which makes you think that perhaps one can truly appreciate a landscape here and insert Tolkien's story into it. The story of Tolkien himself is a story worth discovering. In Oxford, where he lived almost his entire life, Professor Tolkien's presence is still very much felt and loved. One winter's dawn, while John Howe is working away at the other end of the earth, a man arrives in Oxford. Leo Carruthers is a professor of English at the Sorbonne in Paris a leading medieval specialist and an expert on the literature of the Middle Ages. He is also a great fan of Tolkien's world. The first time I heard Tolkien's name, it was as a medievalist. But then one day, some of my friends told me he wasn't just a medievalist who specialized in ancient texts, but that he was also a novelist. They told me about The Hobbit and The Lord of the Rings. Of course, that changed the way I viewed the man, who I subsequently saw not just as a medievalist and philologist, but also as a storyteller, who loved stories and legends. I saw that medieval literature was the source of his inspiration.
We're in Exeter College, Oxford University. Tolkien was a student himself here for four years, between 1911 and 1915. I have books in front of me here that he personally used as a student. In his first year, he was a classic student, studying Latin and Greek, but he subsequently changed to studying ancient Germanic languages. He wanted to study Old English, Gothic, Old German and the Nordic languages at the root of his own culture. This interest in ancient languages, their study, their evolution and their roots is called philology. Today we call it historical linguistics or diachronic linguistics. But philology is such a beautiful word. And it means exactly what it says, a love of the word. Not just of words as we know them today, but also the origins of words, their meanings, why such and such a word has a particular meaning, why it has the form it does, why is it written the way it is and where words come from? It's a passion for words and the research and discovery of the origins of words. From his teenage years, Tolkien had a great love of words that came from the past. These words interested him all the more for their links to the histories of the peoples of ancient times who spoke lost languages and forgotten words. Through these people's histories, myths and legends, from fairy tales through to the sagas of the northern countries, the young Tolkien discovered the worlds that were to make such a lasting impression on him and the worlds that were to determine his dual vocation, that of professor and of writer. Many children play with language and invent words. Tolkien, as a child, took things further. He wanted to invent whole languages that functioned like real human languages, with origins and evolution. Because he wanted to imagine people or beings that spoke the languages he had invented. Around 1915, Tolkien invented his first language, Quenya, the language of the elves. He wrote poems and legends in it, and gradually Quenya became the language of an entire civilization, with a past and a destiny entirely imagined by Tolkien. Unwittingly, young Tolkien had already taken the path that would lead him to create the story of Middle-earth, the continent of the adventures of the Hobbit and the Lord of the Rings, located in a fictitious past of our own Earth. From 1916 or 1917, so he had already left university, he started to draw, dream up and compile a vast mythology he called the Silmarillion, which was to become the history of the peoples who spoke the ancient languages he had invented. In creating his own universe, he quite naturally took his inspiration from the real existing myths and legends he had discovered as a student. Behind Tolkien's mythology lie references, but never to one single real mythology. Instead, he extrapolates and bases his imagination on his knowledge of literature, creating something new. His own fiction, his own mythology, based on ancient tales. One of the most well-known characters among those that populated Tolkien's worlds is Bilbo the Hobbit. Tolkien first told the story of Bilbo to his own children. But he has also enjoyed exchanging with his professor friends among a small literary circle called The Inklings. One of its members was C.S. Lewis, author of the fantastical Chronicles of Narnia. During their get-togethers, the group would alternate between reading ancient texts and reading extracts of the works they were in the process of writing. The Inklings met in Oxford's pubs, some of which still exist today, such as the Eagle and Child. Its walls still echo with the stories that were told there. In a hole in the ground, there lived a hobbit. Not a nasty, dirty, wet hole filled with the ends of worms and an oozy smell, nor yet a dry, bare, sandy hole with nothing in it to sit down on or to eat. It was a hobbit hole, and that means comfort. <laughs> Thank you. 
I've heard about the Tolkien Society. Can you tell me a little bit about yourselves? Yes, so we're the Oxford Tolkien Society, or a part of it at least. I'm Amrit. This is Martha, Joe, and Anahita. We meet in various places around Oxford, mainly in the colleges, to have Tolkien related discussion and hilarity. Generally involves eating snacks, yes. reading extracts from Tolkien, and uh, general hilarity, I think. <laughs> We find that hilarity seems to ensue almost inevitably whenever discussion of Tolkien is raised. It sounds like a hobbit party. <laughs> <laughs> Very much. Well, Joe is our official society hobbit. Unofficial official society hobbit. Unofficial official society hobbit. The latter, I think. The, the laws and bylaws are somewhat complicated, but by some arcane process I've been designated the unofficial official society hobbit. How important is reading the texts to your group? I think it's one of the most important things we do because it's these books that bring us together. If it wasn't for these books and our enjoyment of reading them, we wouldn't be meeting as a society. So we all love to meet up and share our favourite bits. Yeah, absolutely. Mm, yes, the society is about socialising, but it's also about maintaining and expanding our knowledge of Tolkien. And we always find that we get something new out of even the major works. Tolkien lived and worked most of his life here in Oxford. So I believe he wrote his fictional works in his own home. Yeah. Actually, it's not that far away. We could no, take you and show you if you like. Oh, I'd love to. Thank you. There it is. Ah, oh, this is a house. Isn't it surprising that a writer with such a vast imagination who created this wonderful mythology lived in such an ordinary, down-to-earth, banal road? Yeah. Of course, what you've got to remember about Tolkien is he really was quite a stay-at-home character. I mean, apart from a trip to Switzerland in his youth, he very rarely travelled abroad, and he really did prefer to stay uh, at home. That said, uh, that's ignoring the fact that he did make quite a large move uh, in his life. Really? In fact, I can uh, take you there if you want. Please do. Well, here we are. Oh. So this must be where The Hobbit was written? Yes, indeed. Uh, it would have been published in 1937, so it would already have been here for several years by the time of publication. So almost certainly the entirety of the writing would have been done here. I see. Can you imagine him maybe scribbling away behind one of those very windows? It's amazing. An impecunious yeah. academic, as he called himself, oh. that writing a simple story for his children but drawing on so many deep mythological sources. Such a contrast between the myths and the legends that inspired him for The Hobbit. Written in his Oxford home between the 1930s and the 1950s, Tolkien's oeuvre rapidly met with worldwide success. More recently, the films of Peter Jackson have brought the little people who populate The Hobbit and the Fellowship of the Ring to a wider audience. In the Kaitoke Regional Park in northern New Zealand, the magic of the drawings of John Howe and his associate Alan Lee has created the elven outpost of Rivendell. Drawings and a few special effects. With the development of digital effects, John Howe has worked increasingly with computers, using them to add pre-filmed images of decors and virtual landscapes. John Howe also worked a great deal on one of the rare sets to be actually built. In the opening scene of the first film of Peter Jackson's The Hobbit, the fearsome dragon, Smorg, burns down the whole of Dale, an opulent trading town. Barely mentioned in Tolkien's novels, the architecture of Dale had to be invented from scratch, or almost from scratch. How to invent an imaginary town such as this while remaining faithful to the novelist's work?
John Howe takes a final walk around this place he partly drew, in front of its palaces and houses, and through its streets that had to be created in the smallest detail. A few days more filming have been scheduled, and the set will then be destroyed. Opening a book by Tolkien is like opening a hundred books, and you very quickly realize that you need to read those hundred lines that are between. The remains of Dale, one of the most beautiful sets, I think, that was built for these films. But before it was a ruin, the set was a beautiful, beautiful set full of fruit trees and sunny, sunny streets and tiled roofs. And the most inspiring compliments we received when the members of the crew came up to see it when it was first built. And everyone said it reminded them somewhere they'd been on vacation, some wonderful place. But no one remembered the same place. And I think it's the f ultimate tribute to Tolkien's imagination. And that's where Tolkien's power of evocation comes from. It comes from everywhere and from nowhere. And that's why Tolkien's stories have such universal appeal, such enduring enchantment. So in the end, this is really just a vision of a few people for a movie, but um, Tolkien's world is somewhere else, and the real answers aren't here. The real answers are somewhere on the other side of the world. So come with me. It's going to be quite a trip. For John Howe, work on Peter Jackson's film has come to an end. Yet there is one journey he still has to undertake. Tolkien sought his inspiration far from the magnificent landscapes in the studios of New Zealand. His dreamed up Middle Earth and all its characters having drawn on old European sources. What secrets do the figures of European legends hide? What can we learn from Merlin the Magician, King Arthur, the great knight Siegfried and the dragons of the North? For John, the time has come to set out in search of them in order to gain an even better understanding of the immense author of Bilbo the Hobbit. The most mysterious characters in Tolkien's works are perhaps the most discreet. I wonder where the hobbits come from, where he found them. I've tried to draw one here, but it's really not much good. I think they're going to be a little harder to find than that. So, we're going to set out on a journey looking for the Hobbit. The texts that inspired Tolkien were often written in the Middle Ages, and the Middle Ages are synonymous with castles. John will start his search at the castle of O. Königsberg in Alsace, an extraordinary gateway to a journey into the country of legends. The castle of O. Königsberg is the first real evidence of the Middle Ages that John Howe witnessed when he arrived in France to study applied art as a young Canadian student. The castle of Oak Königsberg has a very special place in my heart, as it's the first castle I encountered in Europe. I still remember the first time I saw it. I just couldn't believe it. I thought, it just can't be real. 
And indeed, it's not a real castle. It's a bit like a dream castle, built at the turn of the century, on much older ruins, and actually, these castles that were built to house people now house our imaginations. It's a bit like strolling through a drawing. You can even get lost in it. But first and foremost, let us go through to the other side. Thank <laughs> you. 